Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. God is good. Yes, he is. And all the time. God is good. Amen and amen. amen. So today, we're in Genesis 11. Woo! We're just firing through this, aren't we? <laughs> The title of today's message is, What Would You Do? You know, there's conversation that takes place uh, in a movie, The Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy and the Scarecrow meet up, and um, the Scarecrow tells Dorothy, he says, I, I haven't got a brain, just straw. And Dorothy says, well, how can you talk if you don't have a brain? And the Scarecrow says, I don't know, but some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. <laughs> Dorothy reads, he says, well, yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. <laughs> then she says, what would you do with a brain if you had one? Right. Boy, there's some people I'd like to ask that question. <laughs> but my question for you guys this morning is a little bit different. What would you do if you had a fresh start? What would you do if you had a new beginning? What would you change? <coughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray that your word, your word would go out from this place. I pray that you would touch lives and touch hearts. I pray that this work would be your work. Lord, that you would get all the glory for it. Lord, we thank you for everything. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, we had a message, and we talked about a big red reset button, or a do-over. You guys all remember that? No, it was two weeks ago. You don't remember it at all. That's all I got to do. I just need two sermons every other week. Well, so far in Genesis, we've seen several new beginnings. In Genesis 1, we saw the beginning of everything, Right? And uh, we saw God's creative power. We saw God's nature in there. We even got a glimpse of God's plan. It was awesome. Then in Genesis 3, we saw the deceptive character of sin. The destructive consequences of sin. And the divine covering for sin. And listen, I want to tell you something. None of us in here have led a perfect life. Far, far from it, truly. So when we mess up, here's the thing I want you to keep in mind. We have an enemy, and when we make a mistake, when we mess up, the enemy likes to tell us that now we're not good enough, that now we can't participate, that now we're not wanted. Don't buy into that stuff. Those are lies. Those are lies straight from the pit of hell. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Okay? That kind of language is, that carries a big club of guilt with it. And here's what I know from my years of walking with Jesus. That God never uses guilt. That's a tool of the enemy. God uses conviction. So guilt is what pushes you away. Conviction is what draws you back home. Amen. Amen. So, Karen, I miss you. And you, you can't screw up bad enough. None of us can. We're family, okay? Yeah, that's right. Don't let, don't let that ever keep you away from us. No. Okay? I love you, kid. I really do. So, sorry to single you out, but you kind of <laughs> did that yourself and made me do this. So. But not long after that, in Genesis 6, we find the story of the flood. We just got through that, right? Mm-hmm. And we see human weak, human weakness is at its lowest point. Yeah. <coughs> human wickedness is at its highest point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we have a patient and, and just an amazing, long-suffering God. And he finally said, enough. It's enough. He found one man, and he carried that man and his family through the flood and gave them and us a new beginning. Again, you see. 
The Bible says that at that time, every inclination of man's heart was evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My Bible says continuously evil. <clears throat> as long as there's breath in one of us, it doesn't have to be me. As long as there's breath in one of us that speaks truth, then evil can be overcome. Amen. Only takes one. In case you didn't notice when you go through this whole story all the way up to Jesus, God doesn't pick an army. <coughs> he picks one. He picked Adam. He picked Noah. He picked Abraham. He picked Jacob. And he picked Jesus. And he picked you. As long as there's breath in your lungs, then the truth can be told. It's not just the responsibility of some guy that's up here. Jesus allows us to share in that awesome, awesome, I don't want to call it a chore, it's not a chore, it's an adventure. He said, look, I'm going to let you go out and share the truth, the good news. And through that, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to bless everybody you talk to. And what I can do through you will never end. We were talking this morning in Bible study. You know, how long is our lifetime here? <coughs> 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 years if we're lucky. Mm -hmm. How long is heaven? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to enjoy blessings, where would you want them? I'll give you a hint. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so I want to go to Genesis here, and I just want to just the turn of the page past where God preserves Noah and his family and gives them a fresh start. Mm -hmm. Just one page away in his word. And this is what we see in Genesis 11. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there. And they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And, and they had brick for store, stone and slime they had for wood. <coughs> and they said, Go to, let us build us a city with a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make a name. Let us make us a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower and that the children were building. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. And they all have one language, and this they begin to do. They know now nothing will restrain them, right? Nothing can hold them back. Anything that they imagine can happen. Go, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it so called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. This construction project has gone down in history. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar tried to rebuild the tower and an earthquake shook it down. But it's not just those, just that place where this was built. I mean, this particular one was built there. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. So I want to look, because everywhere around the world, the Babylonians, the Chinese, the Hawaiians even, the Toltec Indians, and they all have a story of building a tower to, to heaven to reach the gods. They all do. 
It made you kind of scratch my head and go, so even though God confounded their language and they went out, they kind of took this idea with them and tried it again. How many times do we have to do things wrong before we figure out what's right? I'm kind of a slow study. My dad used to tell me that I could snatch defeat right out of the jaws of victory. So what can we learn from, from their mistakes? What When we look at this piece of scripture, you know, what... There's so much to take out of this, but there's just one thing that jumps out at me. It's that, you know, how can we learn from what they did? How can we not make the same folly? Well, first let's look at their motive. What was their motive for building this tower? The Bible doesn't give us a very big, deep look at that, really. Uh, but there's a lot of ancient commentaries that have chimed in on the subject. Um, when I was researching this, I came across a, a few. The Book of Jubilee, for instance, says that the people built the tower in order to ascend on it into heaven. And Third Baruch 3, verses 7 and 8, that's a Jewish text. This is a Jewish text, by the way. says that the people not only wanted to ascend into heaven, but they wanted to pierce it. That is, to wage war against heaven and God. An explanation, that explanation is also found in the Babylonian Talmud, in the writings of Philo, of Alexandria, and, and others. This was not a good thing. This was never intended, let's get closer to God. It wasn't that kind of thing, right? Whatever their goal was, I think their motives is summed up in one word, pride. <laughs> pride. In Genesis 11, 4, it says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach up into heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. Well, they said, let's make a name, otherwise we're going to get spread. What happened? They got spread out. They called their own shot, so to speak. But basically, they bought into the same line that Satan had told Eve in the garden. In Genesis 3, 4, and 5, it says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in that day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. It is so strange to me that people's desires is to be their own God. You're born one way and you don't like it. So what are you saying? You're saying that God made a mistake with you? Our God who doesn't make mistakes made mistakes with you, though. Because you don't feel comfortable in what he gave you. Listen, that is tantamount to being your own God. Or trying to be your own. I can be any sex I want to be. I don't even have to be a sex. I can be a they or a them. And if you're confused about all this stuff, you ought to be, because the proper label for it is sexual confusion. They're confused about something that's so blatant and obvious that when somebody gets involved in this mess, I just shake my head and say, I don't know how to talk to you because you deny truth and make up your own truth. Mm -hmm. Now people go, well, now you're beating somebody up here. You're beating up a whole group of people. You're intolerant. Um, yeah, I'll own that. I am intolerant. I don't have the time the energy or the resources to go to somebody that's that confused about life and to try to set them straight when they don't want to be set straight. It's just going to end up being an argument, right? So my go-to here is that I can't do it. But I know someone who can. I'm going to ask him to do it. Okay? And so... There isn't anybody sitting in this room that hasn't been impacted in some way, 
somehow by sexual confusion in our society today. And it's getting worse. It's, it's picking up steam, you know. Okay? Why is it picking up steam? Because we're doing nothing about it. We're stepping back afraid to address the situation, afraid to say anything for fear that we'll break a relationship. But let me tell you something, that relationship's already broken and you're not the one that chose to break it. Now, am I telling you to go and confront these people? Absolutely not. I'm not. I'm telling you that you need to be on your knees praying for them. You don't have it. You don't have what it takes to convince somebody that's thoroughly confused that they're wrong. That's his job. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you don't think that this is a war, this is a war. This is a war. It's a, it's a major battlefield. It's an attack on the family unit. It's an attack on God's plan. So... Should we be offended? Listen, offense brings resentment. We should not be offended. We should, our hearts should hurt for these people. You get what I'm saying? We see somebody that's, that's lost and struggling and, whoa, we're the Christian people. We'll run over there and help you. Wait, you don't know what sex you are? Ooh, run, run, run. <laughs> Why wouldn't you extend the same love and the same forgiveness and the same grace to everybody? I don't see any exceptions in here. There's none. Anybody see any? There's no exceptions as to who we're supposed to share grace and love to. None. None. You know, you have this river of living water as a believer that's flowing into you. And you have a choice. You can you control the what flows out of you. Don't you see that? God has given you this wonderful, beautiful ability to control the flow of grace that comes out of you. And you have a choice. You can say, well, I'm going to shut this thing off because I don't like the way they think. Yeah. And do you think, think God's going to honor that? No. Or you can open it wide open to anybody and everybody. You can just soak them down with the Holy Spirit yeah. and a river, a flood of living water. Yeah. Exactly. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And when we do that, when we just give it all to God and say, okay, God, this is not my problem. This is your problem. You told me to love them. Lord, show me how to love them. Yes. Yes. Lord, I don't have it. I don't know how to love them. Show me how to love them. Exactly. And then you find yourself seeing somebody and it brings tears to your eyes because it hurts you so bad. Yep. That they're walking around living a life, a life wasted in confusion and deception. Yep. It is no different than any other person that is lost. That's right. Exactly. It's a lie. It's a lie. They want to be their own God. They want to believe what they want to believe. I'm not really a, what I would call a political guy. I try to steer clear of politics, especially from here. My personal life is my personal life, and I'm I vote my conscience. But having said that, I see that our society has built their own towers. Whether it be a little tower like the Sears Tower or the Twin Towers or the Eiffel Tower or, you know, these are still monuments to who? Who? Or if it's worldwide corporations, those are towers as well. What are we doing? When, a cor when corporate profit becomes more important than human life, then that corporation is evil. Amen. And when we find an evil corporation that's tied into our political structure, we need to surgically remove it.
Christ. We will make for ourselves a name. Proverbs 16, 8 says, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction. A haughty spirit before a fall. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a story. Some people don't like them, I do. Kind of get the point across. There was a certain pond, and in this pond there were two ducks. And they made friends with a frog. And winter started coming, and the pond started drying up. And the two ducks said, come on, we got to fly someplace where there's more water. And the frog said, hey, what about me? They said, well, you don't have wings. And he said, well, if you guys were to put a stick between your bill, I could hold on to it with my mouth, and you can fly, and I can go with you. And they went, oh, great idea. So they found this good, sturdy stick. The two ducks took it in their bill. Frog grabs hold of the stick, and off they fly, and it's working like a charm. And they're flying kind of low over farmland, and the farmer looks up and goes, Hey, look at that. That's quite the idea. I wonder who thought that up. And the frog said, I did. Yeah. <laughs> Pride comes before the fall. Yeah. Amen? Amen. We, we shouldn't take the opportunities that God gives to us and transfer them to glorify us. Amen. Those opportunities God has given us in order that we can glorify Him. Amen. This is what, these are kingdom principles. Shameless plug, that's what we're teaching in the finance class. <laughs> what, how would our life look different? If we could get that fresh start, how would our life look different if we started our life and finished our life and ran our life on kingdom principles alone? How would this country look different? How would the world look different? How do we make that happen? I want you to repeat after me. You ready? It starts with me. It starts with me. It does. We have to collectively stand side by side, lock arms, and say no. We're not going to let this happen anymore. Our God is a good God. Our God is a gracious God. Our God is a God who's standing there with his arms open, ready to forgive. Yes, yes. Yeah. So listen, world. You want to deny this God? That's up to you. But that doesn't change the fact that he's standing there with open arms saying, please come. doesn't change the fact that his only son died on a cross and shed his blood so that your sins don't count anymore. Right. Amen. So that you can say, I'm complete, I'm whole in the eyes of God. I'm forgiven, I'm redeemed. <laughs> Hang on a second, I gotta catch up somewhere. I think I'm two materials, but I'm not sure. Let it flow. <clears throat> A ziggurat. You know what that is? A ziggurat. Ziggurat. I'm saying, or ziggurat. Not cigarette. Okay. It's with a Z. That's a pyramid that's built in successive layers that are successively narrower in order to allow access by a staircase or walkway to go to the top. That's what they were building. That's what the Tower of Babel was. And the top of these, they've been found all over the world, by the way, and the top of these are usually some kind of a shrine to a false god or goddess. So I'm telling you right now that our language confusion, the confusion that God put on our language, just mirrored the confusion that we had in our minds about who he was and who we were. See, he's God. And I'll let you in on a little secret. We're not. Amen. Amen. And, we, and he's such an awesome God. 
You know, these guys, when they built this thing, they needed to figure out material that would withstand the weight. So all around the world they use stones, but there have been these baked bricks have been found in five different locations where they actually, and in Genesis 11, 3 it says, they said to one of their go to, let us make brick and burn them or bake them thoroughly, right? And then it says they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. That word slime is also translated as tar or, or asphalt. So they use some kind of sticky tar looking stuff to stick the bricks together. And when we uncover these things, we find these things are layered down stone upon stone, can't even put a piece of paper through a Miss Miraculous Aliens did it. When what's happened is the slime, the mortar, the tar has come out over the hundreds and hundreds of years. And these stones have settled in and they fit so tightly that a piece of paper can't go in between. You see, we all these things that the History Channel wants to attribute to aliens, they want to attribute to aliens because the only other alternative to a lot of that stuff is that there has to be a God. And oh, they don't want you to think there's a God. You know, you start keeping stacking brick upon brick. No matter how high that tower is going to reach, it ain't going to reach there. What they fail to see is that heaven, heaven is not a place that's up there. Heaven is another dimension where God lives. It's some place where we can't keep a foot in this world and get a foot in that one. We're either there or we're here. And thank the Lord, the Bible says that when we're out of the presence of our body, we're there. Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You know, there was a guy, I don't know, you guys will probably, re you'll recognize this name anyway. His name was Malcolm Forbes. And he was a business leader. He was a tower builder. That's what he was. He's the one that's uh, remembered, uh, well, you know, Forbes magazine, an influential financial magazine, you know, it's, but the man, Malcolm Forbes, Forbes is known for this saying, he who dies with the most toys wins. And you know, when he died, he had about the, I think it was the largest collection of motorcycles in the world, from antique to mock. He had all kinds of cars. He had yachts, he had castles, liberal castles. And how much of it did he take with him? There was a rich guy, he went to his wife, he says, look, I, I know I'm getting close to death, so here I cut all, all of my money in the sack, run it up to the attic. That way, as my spirit, when I die, goes past, I can grab the money and take it with me. <laughs> and she goes, okay. She runs up the attic. She hangs it from the rafters. And she comes down. She goes, okay, okay, it's done. And he passes away. She runs up to the attic and the bag is still there. She goes, I knew I should have put it in the basement. <laughs> the pursuit of money for the sake of money is folly. It's folly. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21, He said, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, you want to read that last part for me? There will your heart be also. Jesus made it clear that having our treasure in the wrong place, our hearts in the wrong place, falling. Rather than stacking brick upon brick upon brick to make a name for ourselves, don't you think it would be better if we were 
putting our shoulder to the wheel to do kingdom work and expand God's kingdom? Yeah. Just saying. I'm a pastor, what can I do? I don't have any money, I'm broke, what can I do? Well, there's a whiteboard out there in the hallway asking for help. Go take a look at it and see what you can help with. Contact the elder that's involved. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's like too much hassle. That's too much trouble. I don't want to have to call people. Can't somebody just come and come to my house and tell me what I can do for my house to help out? Listen, y'all enjoy the lunch after service, don't you? Mm -hmm. Somebody has to work to make that. Somebody has to put effort into that. And they pour themselves into it. They pour their love into it. I see it. I see it every single week. But how many of us are oblivious to it when we just go out and chow down and visit and then leave? And don't even stop to think about helping out in the cleanup in the kitchen or doing anything else that could make the life easier for the person that worked so hard to prepare that meal. Makes you think, doesn't it? Anybody here going, wow, I, I need to do better at this? Yeah. Okay. Here's the point. And this, this wonderful book makes this point so clearly. Many hands make light work. Make light work. That kitchen would be cleaned up after service in a heartbeat if we had five or six people when they're doing it. The tables, if we had four or five people wiping down the tables, the sanitizing tables, it would only take three or four minutes and would be done. So I'm going to grab a vacuum and vacuum. For the life of me, I can't understand why in a church filled with people that love the Lord, we have to pay somebody to come in here and clean the church. Well, what can I do? Huh? If you're not hearing what you can do right now, then I don't know what to tell you. You don't want to hear what you can do. Well, I live too far away. It's a, it's a pretty good drive for me to come here. You know, so I can't come like in the middle of the week and, and do something for the church. Okay, but you're here now. Just saying. Well, you don't know, I have so much stuff to do at home for me to take on the extra burden of, like, preparing part of a meal. That's, that's too much for me. Have you tried it yet? You might find that you find a whole lot of joy in it. And that joy will stick with you until you get the feeling that people don't appreciate it or aren't willing to put their shoulder to the wheel. Makes my heart sad. You know, the, the people of the time, they were like, let's go up. Come on, let's build this up. Let's go. Let's build ourselves up. Let's get a name for ourselves. Let's, let's build this up. And when they were going up, what did God say? He said, let us go down and confuse their language. That they won't understand each other's speech. So that isn't happening now. Okay? <laughs> you understand me playing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. There's nobody here that says, oh man, he's all of a sudden he's speaking in a foreign language. This is your family. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus, when he was going through what he was going through, and he was meeting with people. They came to him and said, your, your brother and your mother want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, really? Mm -hmm. This is my mother. Yeah. This is my brother. When he was hanging on the cross and all the Marys were there with John. Mary, his mother, was there. He looked down to John before he passed away and he said, 
Woman, behold your son. We're family. This is what kingdom is. You're no longer people I know. We're no longer people you know. We're family. Family helps family. Amen. Okay? When the whole family gets together and has a, something that they feel they need to do, it's going to get done. All right. But if we want to be effective out there, we first have to be effective right here. Does that make sense to y'all? Absolutely. So I can't expect you to run out there and everywhere you go be talking to people about Jesus if you're not doing kingdom work here. They kind of go hand in hand. And I'm thankful for it, Mike. I'm thankful for it, and I praise the folks that do step forward and help. And I understand the folks that they're at an age where they just they can't help. But you know, every one of those folks is at that age where they can't really help anymore. When they were younger, let me tell you, they put their shoulder to it. We've gotten lazy. Mm -hmm. We've gotten to the point where we think we're just worried about us. And we can't do that anymore. If we want God's kingdom to expand here in our community, then we've got to get busy. Amen. You know, pretty much out of stuff. I'm going here trying to figure out. <laughs> Lord, you got me here. you got to get me out. Here's the thing. Is that, you know, there's... Sometimes God has to tear things down mm -hmm. in order to build new upon them. Sometimes our rebellion makes it so it has to be a violent tear down. Absolutely. I've been through a couple of those, more than I care to mention. If you haven't been through one of those, then the Lord has really blessed you. How many of you have seen somebody's life go into total self-destruct mode and you're going... Wow, what just happened to them? There's some rebellion there. There's something there that God is not going to honor. When you honor God, God honors you. Thank you, honey. <laughs> At least one of you out there know that. When you honor God, God honors you. Okay? Listen, you honor God, you you further, you do what you can to further the kingdom, God's going to bless that. This is an adventure, you all. This lifetime we're living, it's an adventure. And sometimes it really sucks. Yes, it does, but we're here. But other times there's great joy. And I'm here to explain to you right now that if you don't have the sucky part, you're not going to recognize the great joy. Amen? Amen. So if somebody says, well, I just want to float along in the middle. No, you don't. Yep. No, you don't. You want to experience what God has for you. Good, bad, otherwise. And if God can't direct us or redirect us when we're off in the weeds someplace, then we're really in trouble. And we're not effective for the kingdom. So we have to lean into him and say, how do you get me back here, God? You know, when you're standing and the light's behind you, Light, bright light behind you, and you're standing with your back to the bright light. What's in front of you? Shadow, Shadow. Darkness. darkness. You find yourself in a dark place. Where are you looking? Which way are you heading? And where do you really want to go? Do you want to be your own God, make up your own mind, and do your own thing? Or do you want to do that thing that you know that God is calling you to do? That thing that He's going to give you a blessing for. A blessing is going to last an eternity. Yes, Why would you keep on rebelling? But if you decide that that's what you're going to do, don't be surprised when God blows stuff up. Right. <laughs> yes, he does. Yeah. And actually, I think what happens, honestly, in my opinion, because we have a good God, he brings good things to our lives, is that he just removes his hand of protection and goes, okay, you want to do that? Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, you don't want to listen to me? Let's see how that works out for you. And then the enemy comes swooping in and destroys everything. Yep. 
And you look at going, what happened? What happened? Yeah. I kept going. I kept going. It's easy for us to spot rebellion in somebody else's life. It's easy for us to look and go, oh, I see what's wrong over there. <laughs> they, they need to repent. <laughs> Just bear in mind, Jesus spoke very harshly about this. Whenever you're pointing one finger at somebody else, three fingers are pointing back at you. Do not judge someone else's walk. God has blessed you with your walk. Amen. Walk that Amen. walk in a way that glorifies and honors God. Amen. From beginning to end, from morning to sunset, walk that walk that glorifies God. Right. The bottom line is, at some point, we're all going to have to surrender to Him. You can't hang on to your life and your way can't be, I did it my way. No, that doesn't work. My way doesn't work. My work, my way leads to destruction. Absolutely. you got to surrender. you got to let go of your pride. you got to kick the pride to the curb. And you got to forgive all offenses. Because when you are prideful, then you're easily offended. Yeah, that's for sure. That's, oh, man, I'm hot stuff. I'm hot stuff. Someone comes up and says, well, you're not so hot. <laughs> what? <laughs> How dare you? I'm hot stuff. Right? Am I telling it wrong? No. Our pride gets in our way of forgiveness. And our lack of forgiveness gets in the way of God's forgiveness. Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother, then my Father in heaven won't forgive you. Oh. Shine a little different light on this. So, get rid of that pride. Don't carry offenses and resentment. Mm -hmm. Bring forgiveness and grace. Amen. Amen. Surrender to Jesus. Amen. That's the only way to live, y'all. It is the only way to live. So back to my original question when we started out. What would you do with a fresh start? If you have one. Hmm. Well, let's build our towers from the right motivation. Let's seek God's glory instead of our own. Let's work with the right materials and store up treasures in heaven rather than treasures on earth. And let's try to avoid the messy stuff, the really, really messy stuff that we get into when we have to do it our way. And let's do it His way. Let's surrender to Him. Let's do it the kingdom way. And the verse I want to leave you with when we close here is Matthew 6, 23. Y'all know this one, right? Would y'all read it with me? But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. Seek Him first. Yeah. Seek His kingdom first. And maybe you're in the middle of your own mess right now. Maybe your life is pretty messy. Maybe you've already stepped into it. And, you know, God doesn't ever go, okay, let's rewind. And you're done. No. God says, okay, you're going to have to trust me to get through this. Yeah. Yeah. That's what He says. And I guarantee, especially as a new believer, Enemy's going to come after you. And when he does, that's your first test. And your first test, let it be a strong test. Let it test your faith to a point where you like don't have anything else to hang on to except Jesus. And you know what? He'll see you through. Amen. Yeah, well, amen. Because he's a faithful God. Amen. Yes, he is. So, what would you do with a fresh start? I can get you one right now. Right here. Would you pray with me? Yeah. Heavenly Father, Lord, forgive us for our trespasses. Yes. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Mm -hmm. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen and amen. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer and you've asked the Lord to forgive you your trespasses, then he is faithful and true to remove all unrighteousness. And that means that you have a fresh start, a do-over, starting right now. Praise the Lord. We have a song. Yes, we do. The power of your love. But if you want, please stand. Start shaking it off.